hello. We all have to do it, but we don't all do it well. What is it? Sleep. Today, we're discussing the top five mistakes that people make when they try to sleep, what the research says it does to our brain, and what you can do about it. At the end, I'll share an awesome resource that will help you baby step toward the perfect night of sleep oh so soon. How much sleep do you need and do you get each night? Pause the video and go comment below to keep you honest about how much you're sleeping and how much you think you actually need. Welcome back. Now that you're back, how much sleep should most adults get each night? You're right, it's less than kids or cats. And in fact, I was reading my daughter's fact book about cats the other day. Did you know that when your cat is 15 years old, it will have slept away 10 years of its life? Now that's some good sleep. The average adult needs seven to eight hours of sleep a night. Yes, there can be exceptions, but this is the general rule and people are notorious for underestimating the amount of sleep they actually need or would be good for their bodies. Now, once in a while, not getting enough sleep or having disrupted sleep probably isn't that big of a deal, but chronic ongoing sleep disruption can cause real problems. Research has shown that in the short term, not getting enough sleep causes your brain to work worse your attention and concentration go down, and you have a harder time remembering things. One meta-analysis looked at 15 different studies of almost 100,000 people. It showed that people who chronically slept less than five hours or more than nine hours were one and a half times more likely to have problems with working memory, memory, and executive functions. But what happens over time? Are there greater risks than temporarily getting distracted or forgetting your wallet at home? A meta-analysis of 27 studies, including almost 100,000 people, showed that individuals who had chronic sleep disturbance had a risk that was 1.68 times higher for developing Alzheimer's disease. The researchers even went as far as to say that perhaps 15% of cases of Alzheimer's disease can be linked to problems with sleep. Recent research also suggests that the frequency of nightmares as we age could be linked to cognitive problems and even dementia. Dr. Abudami Otaiku from the University of Birmingham in the UK has done some really interesting work. He studied over 600 middle-aged people who were cognitively normal, and he followed them for up to 13 years. He also looked at 2,600 older people who didn't have dementia, and he followed them for up to seven years. More distressing dreams was linked to a four-fold increase in cognitive problems for the middle-aged people, and a two-times increase in dementia for older adults. When they looked at the difference between men and women, the research showed that it was only a statistically significant relationship for men. While the research is in its early stages, Dr. Otaiku suggested that this might be happening because of really subtle neurodegenerative changes in the right frontal lobe. This area helps calm negative emotions while we're awake and also while we're dreaming. He suggested that seeking treatment for nightmares which is actually something that can be treated, may actually prevent cognitive decline or dementia. More research will be really helpful in determining whether or not this is useful. So what can we do? Here are the top five things that people do wrong around sleep and how you can avoid them. The first mistake, if you're having chronic problems sleeping, there is a risk you might have a diagnosable and treatable sleep disorder. The problem is that people don't get evaluated for a disorder. Sleep apnea, for example, is a direct contributor to a bucket load of problems. The list is so long, I can't even memorize it in order to be able to say this to you fluently. <laughs> so let me read it for you. It increases your risk for hypertension, cardiac arrhythmia, coronary artery disease, congestive heart failure, stroke, and cognitive impairment. 
And yes, sleep apnea is treatable. No, certainly, this is not the easiest disorder to be able to address. People can really struggle to find the right equipment and use it in a way that works for them in terms of CPAP and BiPAP and so on. But the technology around treating sleep apnea continues to evolve. The masks are better, the equipment is better, and there are more and more treatment options that are being investigated to help people deal with this problem. Also, when I point out to people that sometimes I evaluate patients who have undiagnosed or untreated sleep apnea, and they could be diagnosed with dementia because their brain is working so poorly, and I tell them that if you treat this disorder, especially if you treat it early enough before significant damage is done, that this can be reversible. This can be a real big motivator for people to get a diagnosis and treat. I just want to remind you, sleep apnea isn't always recognizable by yourself or your partner. First, you are sleeping. You don't actually know what's happening while you're trying to sleep and whether or not your body is gasping for air or um, not getting into deep sleep because of a problem like this. Secondly, it isn't always that people are snoring or it isn't always that it's just a disorder for older people who are overweight. Although some of those things can cause problems with sleep apnea or increase the risk of sleep apnea, other people can suffer from it too. Furthermore, it's not just about sleep apnea. There are other disorders that can be recognized and treated, restless leg syndrome, insomnia, and so on. So once we've ruled out potentially diagnosable and treatable sleep disorders, if you don't have one of those, great. Now let's talk about what you're doing in your everyday life. Mistake number two, doing other things in bed. Now this may sound like a funny thing to say, right? Your bed's supposed to be used for a lot of different things. <laughs> but I don't know if you've heard the saying, your bed should be used for sex and sleep, nothing else. If you haven't heard it, put it on one of those little pretty wooden boards and put it up on your wall like they do with great sayings and take it to heart. Human bodies are quite like every other animal that we benefit from consistent training for healthy behaviors. If we train our body that it is supposed to stay alert and awake enough to read that interesting book, to do the next cool wordle or crossword puzzle, to have that complicated discussion with your significant other, or to solve the world's problems, your body will respond. It will remain alert. It will not think that it's supposed to fall asleep. What we want to do instead is to train it so that when we get into the comfort of our bed, it immediately says, oh, I know what to do here. I'm feeling sleepy. I think I'm going to fall asleep because you have trained it appropriately to recognize that's what it's supposed to do in that environment. This leads to the third thing that people do wrong. Mistake number three, staying in bed when you can't sleep. Remember, the bed is useful for falling asleep and sleeping well not for when we're tossing and turning and trying to get to sleep. If you can't fall asleep after 15 minutes or so, get out of bed. Now here's the kicker. When you do get out of bed, there are certain things you should and shouldn't do. I've had well-intentioned patients tell me, well, they got out of bed because they knew that was a good thing to do if they weren't able to sleep, but then they went out and saved the world. And when I say save the world, I mean they did things that were super productive. I had one patient who exercised. I had another patient who did all her canning for the summer. <laughs> I had somebody who did house cleaning and it was wonderful. So when you are training your body in the middle of the night, no, I can't sleep in bed, so I should wake up and be productive. This is the wrong kind of training again. What we want to do is get out of bed keep the lights low, keep very calm, and do something very boring. I joke with people that my office policies and procedures uh, handouts that I give them when they come to see me are perfect for this task because it's so boring. And as you're reading this slow, unimaginative, just ridiculous material, that you are going to get tired and sleepy. Whatever it is that you're doing that's low key and not stimulating, once you feel like, wow, I think I could fall asleep, get back in bed and try it again. 
If you're not sleeping after 15 minutes, get back out and repeat the process. Yes, this can be tedious and it can make for a very tired next morning when you are like, oh my goodness, I was in and out of bed 14 different times last night. I didn't get any sleep at all. But when you train your body consistently and you go to bed the next night, it is much more likely to recognize I am really tired and I want to go to bed. It will thank you for the consistency. The fourth mistake that people make with their sleep is not having a regular sleep schedule. Do I think it's great to stay up late on New Year's Eve and throw confetti at midnight? Yes. Do I think it's wonderful to go to your neighbor's wedding and dance the night away until late? Yes, I think that's great. Do I think that it's a wonderful caring giving thing to help out with your grandchildren at night once in a while, which means it might disrupt your sleep as they need comforting and soothing. A beautiful thing to do. I don't think it's okay to have a regular practice of changing your sleep schedule. Some nights you go to bed at 11 or 12. Oh, this night you're up until two. You're really tired, so you sleep in until 10 or 11 the next day. Or maybe you don't sleep in, but then you go to bed at nine the next night to try to make up for it. Remember how we need to train our bodies to do well? Yep, that goes for sleep schedules too. That means going to bed within about a half an hour of the same time every night and trying to get up at roughly the same time the next morning, regardless of whether it's a weekday or a weekend or whatever happened the night before. Once your body gets trained into that type of routine, a lot of people say they don't even need an alarm clock to wake up the next morning because their body is so used to going to bed, sleeping and getting up again. Because it's helping our body have a regular schedule. Now we get to the last thing that people do wrong with their sleep. And it's a tricky one. Accommodating everybody and everything else. The cat likes to sleep on my head, so I let him, even though it keeps me awake. This is definitely one that I do. <laughs> The toddler needs me to come to them. And yeah, this is probably another one that I'm guilty of. My partner snores, but I don't want to inconvenience them by asking them to do something about it or addressing the problem in some other way. My old dog has to go potty several times a night. What am I supposed to do? Let him pee on the floor? I leave my phone on in case there's some emergency that comes up with work. And yes, I've had people tell me that they actually do this because they were prioritizing their work over their sleep. This can be hard. It's difficult to prioritize yourself first and not prioritize others, even when it comes to chronically messing up your sleep. Here's the kicker. If you could have figured this out by yourself, you would have done it already. In these cases, it really helps to talk to someone. I'm hoping that you can find someone who is understanding, empathetic, and yet firm. Talk to them about the situation, what's happening and what's disrupting your sleep so that they can help you baby step in the direction of thinking of something new, possibly outside of your current box, that can possibly meet everybody's needs. Addressing these five mistakes will take you a long way toward getting a good night's sleep and protecting your brain. But in case you'd like more information, it's available. The discipline of CBTI, or Cognitive Behavioral Therapy Insomnia, not just for insomnia, can help you address the fundamentals of your sleep problem and inch toward this idea of getting a better night's sleep on a regular basis. There are psychologists that specialize in this kind of work and you can search for them online, but there are also online resources. One that I love to recommend is called Slumber Camp. I even love the name. It's a 28 day email course and it provides the fundamentals of CBTI available to you. It costs $29 and he even says on his website that he will offer scholarships for people where that would be a financial hardship. He's really invested in making sure that this information gets to everybody. I'll put the link in the description below. So there you have it. Let's work to improve our sleep together. I know I have work to do, especially with kiddos and pets, but I would really like to work with you to change what we're doing and make our sleep better. Please comment below to tell me what sleep struggles you have so I don't feel so alone and we can support each other along the way. If this was useful to you, 
pass it along to someone else who could benefit. And feel free to watch my other videos on how to move toward this idea of exercising in a way that's good for your brain, which is also another way to promote good sleep. Thanks for coming, and I can't wait to see you again.